Uh, and yesterday, let me summarize. I summarize. I told you that today's dark energy is completely useless for any purpose. But dark energy, decaying dark energy, was extremely useful for creating of our universe in past. And if we would assume this kind of thing, plus, in addition, we want to use quantum theory, quantum fluctuations, we are arriving to four robust predictions, smoking gun, what I would say. Okay, if you remember, one prediction was that universe today should be flat, namely to have Euclidean geometry. Second prediction was that perturbation should be adiabatic. It means that energy density can vary from place to place, but the ratio of different components, for instance, like number of photons per baryon, or number of photons per, per particle of dark matter should stay constant everywhere, okay? It's full contradiction with original assumption, okay, with the theory which people was developing all his life, so-called entropy theory of galaxy formation. Third prediction should be, perturbation should be perfectly Gaussian, Namely, at the beginning, it should be a random Gaussian field, contrary to very popular series, which were very popular in the 80s, like cosmic string, topological defects, textures, etc. Uh, and fourth thing was that there should be red tilted spectra for the initial perturbations of the metric, which will be produced from quantum fluctuation. Contrary to the statement which you hear in many cosmological talks, like inflation predicts more or less flat spectrum. You see, it's not more or less flat spectrum. It should be robust prediction, always should be Red tilted spectrum, very unusual thing because amplitude of perturbation should grow to larger scale. But of course, when scale changes, it should be logarithmic dependence, when scale changes by factor about 100, amplitude is changing by few percent. I remember that actually I tried to get rid of this logarithmic dependence, why? Because for me, it was more important at this time to please Zildovich. And Zildovich have predicted the spectrum should be perfectly flat. So amplitude of perturbation should be the same in every scale for gravitational potential. It was so-called Harrison Zildovich spectrum. But unfortunately, I could please him, or fortunately, only up to logarithmic corrections. And of course, there was no dream that the things can be ever, ever measured. Starobinsky, who wrote paper in 79, that there is a consequence of this theory of earlier domination of dark energy, was 79, namely flat spectra of gravitational waves. And he wrote that perhaps it will be possible to measure in future, I'm making normally a joke, perhaps Lyosha, he by the way passed away recently, a uh, few months ago, several months ago, in December, I think that you were thinking not about next millennium, but about millennium after next millennium, because it's impossible. It was happening at the time when people tried to find fluctuation of background radiation without any success. There, of course, there was some kind of claim, in particular by Melchiori, was excellent experimentalist, but then actually this claim were disappearing because what he has seen perhaps was due to the large cluster in the vicinity of us. But okay, the result. But before I go to all these things, of course, you could ask me a natural question. Can you spoil prediction of a nice theory? Because what is the definition of nice theory? Because right now people also confuse this philosophical question. 
Many people think that initial condition should be as simple as possible and the theory as general as possible. You could see, for instance, some cosmological scenarios where potential includes 180 terms. I think actually some kind of madness. I have opposite point of view. Initial condition should be as generic as possible and the theory should be as simple as possible. You see Popper principle that theory should be as simple as possible but not more simple than it's necessary. Now, can we spoil predictions? Of course we can spoil prediction, okay, if the guy is skillful in theoretical physics, he can do whatever he wants. And as I normally say, no series were ever ruled by experiment. Normally, bad series die together with their inventors. If some theory contradicts to experimental data, the guy introduces extra parameter to fit this data. You see, but then people lose interest and finally nobody remembers about this theory because I can tell you there was so many series of galaxy formation besides of entropy, there was the turbulent theory of galaxy formation to explain the rotational curves of the galaxies or the rotation of the galaxies. Of course, right now everything is forgotten. And when I moved to United States because I wanted to find job before that. I didn't care about United States because everything outside of Soviet Union was for me like the space outside of black hole from which you know that you cannot send any signal. No, some people were managing to send signal or from which you cannot escape. Therefore, why should I care? Once in 82, we have sent paper to monthly notice. We wanted to publish it in JET as usual, but Zildovich insisted. He told, I'm on editorial board. Yeah, but then we have sent this paper to monthly notice. Zildovich even wrote letter. Then Bernard Carr, as he told me later, was the referee of this paper. Can you imagine what this guy did? He took out 25 pages paper and have completely rewritten with pencil all the text in the good in, in good English. And we got this paper back asking to retype it. But the question was who is supposed to retype it because secretary told that she typed it once, therefore next time we have to pay her. And you know how much to retype the paper costed? It was approximately my monthly salary. Then nevertheless, after this, there was a special meeting of scientific council and it was decision like secretary should do it for half of the price, which theoretical department of Lebedev Institute will pay. And if she will not agree, she will be fired. So it was very good decision. Nevertheless, then we got back this paper, but I used this underlying of capitals. For instance, like if you write CS squared, right? CS squared, then if it's small, I was doing this thing with pencil. If this thing was small, I was doing this thing. But you know, these English idiots typed all this kind of pencils. Then I told, okay, guys, remove it. They told me, no problem, 300 pounds, okay, yearly salary, and we will remove it. This is the reason why actually you can check, perhaps it's the only paper where long formula looks horrible even. Okay, but when I moved to US, of course, I needed to find some job. And as a result, we published uh, the paper to which now everybody is referring, but okay, it was just some kind of translation of my uh, dissertation, where most of the things I even didn't care to publish, and there was the section which is called extension. It's called garbage collection, because we have considered different options 
how to spoil robust predictions of the theory of earlier domination of dark energy, which is called inflation. So we have considered, for instance, two scalar fields. We were able to get this kind of spectra instead of simplest spectra, just introducing second scalar field. Okay, we also introduced the what became later known as Curvaton scenario, but the name Curvaton, okay, of course, was given by English guys. But then Linda discovered that we had in our paper, in some of our papers, this curvaton. So we are fathers of curvaton also. Some people proud about all kids. But okay, I cannot say that I share this attitude. So it was not very good thing, but okay, I can say if something is shitty, then I can call it shitty because I produced it. I have right to say it, right? Very good. In spite of the fact that these papers collected more than 1,000 references. You see, but we could generate non-Gaussianities, etc. But nevertheless, in this section, it was clearly written. How is there ever such a procedure is extremely unappealing since it implies a complete loss of predictability. You know, when there was a final meeting, not final, I mean, the first meeting about Planck experiment, one of the guys who was giving talk there, let's not specify it, him, yeah, told guys, doesn't matter what we, you will measure. I have a model to explain everything. The Mandalese who was sitting there asked him, is physics for you natural or social science? Okay. Because for me, physics is natural science. Therefore, I'm not trying to fit observational data with multi-parameter curves. And in this sense, okay, there was some kind of statement that there are many inflationary scenarios, okay, which could fit everything, yeah? For me, there is only one inflation theory, which is real, the theory, only when it's understood as a stage of unbroken accelerated expansion due to the same ingredient, which is responsible for quantum fluctuations. When I will take one ingredient, which will be responsible for accelerated expansion, and the other ingredient, which is responsible for production of the galaxies, I can screw all the predictions and I can get whatever I want. You see? Otherwise, as I wrote here, it's rubbish without any predictions. Now, there was some kind of, in this case, it's unbeatable as predictive theory because it allows us to calculate the effect of amplification of quantum fluctuation in completely controllable weak coupling regime, while most alternatives cannot compete even with rubbish inflation in a sense of controllable reproduction of outcome for quantum fluctuation. Here I can mention two examples about which you heard for sure. It's this kind of ekpirotic universe, bouncing cosmologies, or string cosmology by Gabriele Veneziano, because there, when you are producing something, you do not know how to carry to the expanding universe. And I can prove the theorem that if you want to amplify quantum fluctuation in expanding universe, then you cannot avoid the stage of earlier uh, dominance of dark energy is the theorem. Of course, all theorems have loopholes, but here it's unbeatable theory because it's related with causality, yeah? And causality is something what is untouchable. There is no something what propagates faster than the speed of light. Of course, I can make even models, I think, we even wrote paper about propagation in the media with the speed larger than the speed of light. Therefore, okay, when people so-called discovered 
super light neutrinos, about which you heard perhaps. Yeah. Oh, better to say 10 extra meters of the cable, as it happened later. I was invited nearly to all conferences about superluminal propagation, where I said, no way, yeah, forget about it. So, as you understand, also, of course, all this kind of ekpyrotic universe or pyrotechnic universe, okay, about which there was so much blah, 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 they are also doing the thing in extremely fine-tuned way in the contracting branch of the universe. I even know how to go through the singularity, but nevertheless, here you have to arrange very special initial condition. Why inflation is good? Because you can start with any kind of garbage, and this garbage will be thrown by exponential inflation outside of the observable range. It gets rid of the garbage. The rest, when you have contracting universe, is a garbage collector. And of course, you don't want to have theory as a garbage collector. Now, okay, there was also a lot of discussion about problems, because there was, this I will speak later about, this broad discussion about multiverse, because people found that if you will start to use quantum fluctuations, then in all own known models, if it lasts long enough, inflation is never over everywhere in the space. And if we live in this universe, like prediction was, that behind of the horizon, most of the space is occupied by the sitter. Because there is some kind of confusing notion of the temperature of the desitter, people were writing, oh, you can have Boltzmann brain and in infinite space-time, in infinite desitter universe, the probability that all of us appeared at each moment of time as a result of statistical fluctuation with all our memory about our parents at each moment of time is much higher than we will produce as a result of the natural selection. You heard about it? It was actually a very hot topic discussed for some kind of reason by physicists, by not philosophers. So you mean that philosophers still didn't get to this kind of madness. Okay, but... Huh? Yeah, okay, very good. But now, let me take cosmology, extract from it, or minus, remove from it theology, and what is left from inflation, which is useful for us, cosmic inflation. Exponential or quasi-exponential expansion. Why quasi? Because we don't want to live in the Sitter universe during at least last 70 efforts, not so much. It's cosmological constant at this time, inverse cosmological constant, multiplied by 70, it can be 75, it can be 100. It becomes disaster when it's 1 million, but 1 million you don't need because 70 efforts, or better to say even 65, are responsible for producing of all this matter within visible horizon. All these hundred billions of galaxies. And then, of course, if you forget about all metaphysical questions, that there is no problem with prediction which could falsify the theory in exactly proper sense. You see? Uh, and, okay, some people who think that proper principle in this sense is already old-fashioned, okay, I disagree with them very strongly because some old-fashioned principles are much better than new invented principles. Like, okay, my theory is the best because I convince the whole community. Honestly speaking, I don't care so much about community. 
because it's not political science, as you know, physics is a natural science. What is relevant for predictions? Okay, Zildovich some time ago says that, oh, cosmology is the cheapest accelerator for poor people. Now what can I say? For very poor people, because general relativity doesn't care about particle physics too much and about even less about particle physicists. And what is relevant in the past are the things which you know very well, okay, which are responsible for gravity, energy density, and pressure. And the big difference between relativity and Newtonian theory is that pressure also contributes to the gravity in a essential way. For instance, for spherical symmetrical case, what produces you gravity, energy density, plus three multiplied by pressure. So pressure is as valuable as energy density. But because for most of the things here, pressure is negligible compared to the energy density, people, okay, were, have never seen it in Newtonian theory, which was perfectly well. But from the point of view of general relativity, we are all pressure equals zero. So we are all dust in this sense. You see, besides of one guy in this room, which guy is it? Radiation, which has pressure equal one third of energy density. And the second guy is this dark energy, which has pressure is equal minus energy density. Now, what I have to assume to make all prediction? I have to assume that there was some stage when matter was imitating approximately cosmological constant. It means cosmological constant corresponds to the equation of state precisely pressure is equal minus energy density. This is cosmological constant rewritten in terms of pressure and energy density. If it would be just at early time, cosmological constant, then it would leave us desert. Nothing would exist. Therefore, you have to imitate the thing and you have to assume here the sign approximately. Therefore, this kind of symmetry which the sitter space has, and about which, okay, there are many papers, how to formulate scattering matrix problem, etc., etc., etc. Come on, who is going to measure any cross section in the sitter space? I think it's a joke, yeah? So, you see, therefore, there should be spoiled symmetry because you understand that in physics, the main thing, symmetry, are important, but even more important, spoiled symmetries. Because if you will take strong interactions, then this theory is a scale loss. You see, it's invariant with respect to the wild transformation. But why theory becomes so non-trivial? Because of this running coupling constant, because of the phenomena which is called, um, uh, uh, how it's called, uh, well, doesn't matter, okay, so I am getting also some words and names drops from my mind, <laughs> okay, so because you see, symmetry is spoiled by logarithmic corrections. And they appear so-called confinement scale. This, when the theory becomes useful for description of the strong interactions. Then, you have to assume that epsilon plus p divided by epsilon was not equal zero, but it has to be much, much smaller than unity during last 70 e falls. And then in this case, the scale factor can be written approximately 
like the value, the size of the universe at the end of this stage, multiplied by exponent minus n, where n is the number of if false until the end of this stage of accelerated expansion. You see? So what I have to assume? I have to assume that 1 plus w much less than 1 for n much larger than unity before the end of the inflation. This, I don't need to assume that it should become finally of the order of unity at the end of the inflation because I want to have graceful exit from the stage of accelerated expansion to the normal gravity. And I also assume that 1 plus w is a smooth function of n. These are the only things which I am assuming. Now, of course, you could ask me a question. But what about all these inflationary scenarios? Okay, because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of them. What is the purpose of these scenarios? And moreover, there is, was the statement which you maybe have seen in many papers that inflation is not a unique theory, rather, but rather a class of model based on similar principle. It's rubbish. Statement is nonsense because if you understand inflation as the theory, the only purpose of inflationary model relevant for observation is a mapping of some kind of potential of scalar field to the equation of state P is equal minus epsilon. And this mapping happens to be not crucial for robust predictions, but important only for excluding definite potentials, which anyway we will never be able to verify in any independent experiment. Moreover, Okay, I can invent hundreds of the potential to imitate what I need. Just give me the result, okay, and on bed, for a couple of bottles of wine, I will invent you at least 10 within one hour. Now, and I was doing it, by the way, you have to know perhaps that I am authors of many classes of inflationary scenario, like K-inflation. I was ashamed even to speak about this thing, but okay, my friend was sitting, getting on my nerves and telling me that I'm paying you money and you are doing nothing. Then we invented this K-inflation, about which I gave no single talk, but now I think it's again collected 2,000 references, something like this one. So you see, and then people are inventing all kind of potential and I will show you two. One is like this one, with blah, blah, blah for supersymmetry and string theory. The other is like this one, monodromy potential. When I was giving this talk once, both authors were in auditorium. One guy has a sense of humor, and he told me, but okay, I was just studying supersymmetry, therefore it was the purpose of the whole thing. But the author of the other scenario thanked me for reference, okay, because didn't understand that I'm trying to make fun. Sure. And you will be especially impressed if you realize that the only thing what is important for this potential for the cosmological prediction is the value of this potential at one point, which fixes you the amplitude of perturbation, and the combination of first and second derivative at the same point. The rest is irrelevant. You see, if you will open papers, okay, because French has usually made encyclopedia of inflationary scenarios, which contains I think 300 scenarios, most of them are different mostly by the names because you, there is huge number of names, I don't want to even, because you can go to Rocky Cope talk, he will show you two pages with the names of inflationary scenarios, you see. But instead of doing this thing, you can do much more simple thing. 
you could assume that these three conditions which I said are satisfied. So there is the stage of earlier domination of dark energy with smooth, graceful exit. And of course, the natural would be to assume, because the function when n is very large should go to zero, and then should grow, and at this point it should happen some kind of transition, graceful exit to the stage of the normal gravity. Try to imagine functions. Of course, mathematician could come and tell you, oh, I can imagine potential which take value one in rational numbers and number zero in irrational numbers. But okay, let's not be crazy especially taking into account that the only part of the whole thing which corresponds to the measurement is this part around 50 e folds till the end of the inflation. You see? And then the only reasonable function which you could write for p plus epsilon divided by epsilon is some numerical coefficient beta of the order of unity divided by n in power alpha. Beta is not so relevant. It's relevant only for power low potentials. Alpha is much more important. And moreover, I can map all these 300 scenarios, in fact, to two numbers. Alpha, beta, as I told, is practically irrelevant. For this power low potential, it's relevant because it gives the same order contribution as alpha. But alpha is more important thing, you see? And it's free parameter of the theory. Now, of course, you can write here logarithms if you want, etc. But it doesn't matter. If you make this assumption, then you are getting smoking guns prediction for inflation, non-confirming any of them would falsify the theory, namely flat universe, adiabatic perturbations, small non-Gaussianity, so it means that if the amplitude of gravitation potential which was generated 10 minus 5, maximum admixture of non-Gaussianity can be at the level of 10 minus 10. So you can imagine what kind of numbers we are talking about. And so-called FNL, if you remember, I wrote yesterday, okay, you write gravitational potential, then there is the part which is uh, Gaussian, which is of the order of 10 minus 5 to form the galaxies, plus FNL, F squared. So this is number 10 minus 10. You see in prediction for this F and L that it should not be more than just few, okay, of the order of unity. It should be of the order of unity because for the realistic model of the universe, nobody calculated, but okay, for the dust dominated universe, I was estimating it because of nonlinearities. It was three perhaps. But it's clear that it cannot be 100. If it would be 100, then everything would be gone. And then red tilted spectra. So in the observable part of the spectra, okay, it can be approximated, gravitational potential squared, as the scale in power 1 minus ns, where ns is called spectral index. And it's clear that if you want potential to grow with the scale, and S should be smaller than 1. Then you can calculate for the equation of state what is the theoretical prediction. Then you are getting that the whole thing is expressible in terms of deviation of equation of state from cosmological constant and from the rate of the change of the deviation of the equation of state from cosmological constant. And both terms are positive. In this sense, NS should be 
smaller than one. You can make this exercise and you will find that irrespectively of the model, NS should be smaller than 0 0.97. Then, in particular, if you take particular inflationary scenario like M squared phi squared, or if you take uh, A squared gravity, like Starobinsky model, what is known, then you will get that the main contribution in one case, in case of Starobinsky model, Higgs inflation also here, comes from here. And it will be 2 divided by the number of faults when the scales from which galaxies were formed, on which galaxies were formed, left so-called the sitter horizon. In the case of M squared phi squared potential, both term contributes equally. And also you get there is some kind of degeneracy there. But this is the only case when there is degeneracy. Uh, but anyway, as I told you, this other theory was excluded by observations. Yeah. Now, moreover, Okay, of course, you could blame me that I make this kind of statement only now when everything came in agreement with experiment. No way. Because, for instance, now here, I was giving talk in Cambridge in 2000, and I clearly wrote that spectral index should be smaller than one. It can never be what is called harrison zeldovich spectrum because it's related with the broken symmetry. You see? Namely, with the broken time translation invariance for the sitter. Only in this case, it can be useful. And moreover, okay, in 2003, when still there was no any hint that people will ever be measuring this kind of things, Okay, I wrote that contrary to erroneous belief that inflation doesn't predict the scale invariant Harrison Zeldovich spectral. The spectral index should be in the range between 0 0.92 to 0 0.97. This was the solid predictions. Now, moreover, as I told you yesterday, you see, in this red tilde spectrum, NNS comes the number of the order of unity, respectively of inflationary scenarios, but you can show that it should be larger than 1.5. And also uncertain parameter, beta b, which is important, which depends on the mechanism of the reheating after inflation, because after inflation, you have to form radiation, you have to form normal particle, you have to decay if you want your inflaton field. It could be very fast, it could be more slow, there could be the stage of domination of dust after that, but it leads just to some kind of uncertainty which relates galactic scales with cosmological scale of the order, with the scales of CMB. Because here you see what comes here, logarithm of galactic scale to centimeter, millimeter scale. With some uncertainty, coefficient which is of the order of 100 anyway is also relevant, but actually it will be relevant for verification, further verification of inflation as you understand in the particular model. This quote I actually told you yesterday, therefore no need to repeat it. This, I think, is some kind of talk which I gave on Hawking 75 birthday for the fun. Unavoidable uncertainty in B, as I said, is a bad news for the model builders. It leads to theoretical uncertainty in prediction of NS of order 0 0.05. And now the accuracy of the measurement of the spectral index is precisely 0 0.005. And it cannot be improved further because of so-called cosmic variance, 
You know what is cosmic variance? When we are making measurement, we are making statistics. But you understand that we have, for instance, within our horizon, only five multiples. Therefore, okay, it's not statistically too much representative. There could be some kind of variations. When you have multiple about 100, then we have already 201 representative. So you can make on 200 guys already some statistic. You see, on one hand, for low multiples, you have more pristine information. On the other hand, you have more uncertainty relating related with this so-called cosmic variance. Now, this thing we will never overcome, this uncertainty 0 0.05, and right now, we already at this level of sigma, okay, which is, uh, spectral index is measured with 0 0.04, something like this one, accuracy. For any model. And therefore, hence, further increasing of experimental accuracy in NS will not help us much in model selections. You see, because there is hundreds of models, you have seen perhaps these pictures many times. Of course, if theory is very good, then even Newtonian theory, that it has infinite number of predictions. Okay, because you can calculate second order corrections, third order corrections, fourth order corrections, up to, I do not know. For instance, for, for the emission of the gravity waves now, people are doing these kind of things. But they are not smoking guns, which would rule out the theory. They just can confirm your theory or maybe disprove the theory if it's realistic prediction. And further prediction is existence of primordial gravitational wave and non-Gaussianity is due to non-linearity of Einstein equations. Third order correlation function, fourth order correlation function, etc., etc., etc. Perhaps the most perspective thing would be to measure gravitational waves. And moreover, with this purpose, Japanese approved experiment, which is called Light Bird, where they are going to find B mode of polarization, which is due to the gravitational waves. But you understand that uh, this kind of things for the primordial gravitational wave was never a priori not robust prediction because you understand that this was a free parameter, alpha, for the theory. For instance, alpha is equal 1 for the power law potential. Alpha is equal 2 for Higgs inflation and um, uh, so-called A squared, Starobinsky model. Then alpha is equal 3 for so-called new inflation, you see? Uh, but you understand that a priori there is no law bound on this amplitude unless you measure spectral index with good enough accuracy. And this is actually very clear why. Because if you measured an S here, and then you take this spectrum of fluctuations, this is amplitude versus scale, to the lowest possible scales, it defines you the scale of inflation, Hubble constant, and the amplitude of the gravitational waves cannot be less than this thing. You see, and low limit for NS equals 0 0.96 on this amplitude or the ratio of tensor to scalar ratio is half of the percent. This is what is the purpose for light bird, because they are going to use 18 frequencies, send satellite, okay, sliding frequencies, and they are going to extract information, but in very 
so-called narrow range of multiples between 80 and 120 because there is gravitational lensing and there is B mode of polarization which is invented by the other astrophysical regions. The only pristine region in this case, low range of multiples or very low multiples if there was reionization, then also, okay, gravitational wave could generate uh, big B mode of polarization. But for low multiple, I told that there is other problem because there is big cosmic variance. Not enough statistic. You see, but on the other hand, of course, people tell me now you have to see it, right? It will be your natural reaction. Therefore, this Japanese guy are doing good job. But it's a questionable thing. You know why? Very simple reason. Because NS... We know only with a certain accuracy, okay? And within two sigma, which is not so-called so unusual thing, it can be zero point ninety five. But in this case, the low bound on the ratio of tensor to scalar perturbation will become uh, not half of the percent, but it will become. 0.06%. So it will be in seven times smaller. And there is no practical possibility to reach this level of sensitivity because you understand that when you measure this kind of thing, I will tell you later to, tomorrow, for instance, about the measurement, you have to get rid of the backgrounds. And it's not so simple because originally the maps come very dirty. It's like very dirty photograph, okay, we 100 years old, and after that, you have digitally to remaster it. For that, you need many frequencies. This is the reason why Planck, for instance, was using observation on nine frequencies. And WMAP was using only three frequencies. Thus, detection of the primordial gravitational field will provide us an extra confirmation that quantum fluctuations were amplified at the stage of accelerated inflation. Moreover, it will even allow you to put low bound on the spectral index, yeah? But failing to detect them at the planned level of half of the percent, I think I missed here one zero, would not have any implication and in no way can be considered as a proof of alternative for amplification of quantum fluctuations. By the way, nobody doubts quantum fluctuation, but even those people who are doing pre-Big Bang cosmology, ekpirotic cosmology, everybody is using quantum fluctuations. The only question which they are discussing, who amplifies this quantum fluctuation? You see, quantum fluctuation, there are no alternative anymore. You see? But people, some people still think that instead of stage of exponential expansion, they can have some different mechanism for amplification of quantum fluctuations. Uh, but the subject here of this uh, amplification uh, is uh, an you can say, you can call it inflaton, but you can call also inflaton, for instance, not just scalar field, but it could be. Why you call it inflaton? You could call inflaton also dark energy in principle, right? But if you would take gravity like this one, and then 1 over m squared r squared term, you cannot call it inflaton, perhaps. You see? Oh, moreover, what can you do if you don't want to do this thing? Make psi phi multiplied by A. Where phi is normal Higgs field. It's called Higgs inflation, but they are equivalent. You see, they are practically indistinguishable from the point of view of predictions. Not practically. In fact, actually, they are just indistinguishable. Because if you not take into account this kind of reheating mechanism, which is an our head, some kind of imagination. Nobody knows what was happening at the energy stance 13 GV. 
They will never be reached on accelerators. Forget about it, you see. Because if you want to reach Planckian energy on accelerator with the current technology, you know what should be the size of the accelerator? Not 120 kilometers like CERN tries to do. It should be the size of our universe for the current state of technology. Detect in indirectly uh, gravitational waves of the, from the first uh, moment of the universe. This data no. would be useful? No. Completely. Forget about them. It was one of the biggest disasters. I will tell you about it later because some people, okay, decided to gamble. Okay? Oh. I can name them. I think they deserved it. In spite of this gambling, by the way, nevertheless, all of them got permanent positions, okay, 10 years. I was furious about this thing, but then people told me, oh, they are young people. I thought, come on, 40 years old is not young. I, of course, recall that one of the members of our hiring committee at LMU told me that according to Herr Muhanov, one, everybody should commit suicide at the age 40. I told... Perhaps, but not everybody has courage to do it. Therefore, okay, we can wait. But, okay, about bicep, I will speak separately. Of course, gravitational waves were detected, but not primordial gravitational wave. And perhaps right now you think about LIGO. No way, I am not speaking about LIGO. There is a question about LIGO, which are not answered. But there is these binary pulsars, okay? These Taylor, etc., observations, and some people say direct or indirect detection, but I'm sorry, if you see these perfect curves from astrophysics, okay, change of the period of the rotation with unbelievable accuracy, you can call it indirect, but on the other case, when your mirrors are moving by the size which is million times smaller than the size of nuclei. You can want to tell me that it's more direct than astrophysical things? The joke. You see, this is the reason why some people will say, oh, they detected gravitational waves on the Earth. Come on. The other also comes on the Earth. If they exist, there is a lot of them. It's not a big deal. You see, in detection of gravitational room in this room, in the other room, etc. It's not new discovery. Okay, then, non Gaussianities. It was actually the most interesting story because first two things were passing for a very long time, but before Planck release, somebody spread it rumors that. Planck found F and L 400. Somebody, now I cannot find who spread this rumor because I know all these principal investigators who are not aware, but people who are under them, of course, could spread this rumor. Moreover, three months before Planck release, there was a conference in Munich organized for 160 people where they were going to discuss non gaussianities of course, half of the people who knew that there are no known Gaussianities came to Munich because in Munich there is very good beer, as you understand. I refused to come to this conference. Everybody was sending me hello. Moreover, before Planck release, I got call from my friend who was telling me, Slava, let's write paper. You are the only idiot who is going to speak about Gaussian perturbation on this conference. People planned a lot of summer school, three months summer school in Santa Barbara to discuss non gaussianities What does it mean to spread rumor in the right time? Then I talked to my friend, look, I know myself how to generate non gaussianities as big as you want. But if there will be non gaussianities forget about theory. It will become toy, yeah? which might be have something to do with nature, or maybe has not too much to do with nature, but the level of confidentiality 
will be dramatically lost because it's non-repeatable thing. It's not like physics when you can repeat experiment, you see? Here, you have unique opportunity to measure something, okay, what was predicted. Normally, cosmology was never predicting anything. For instance, you can say that Friedman predicted, predicted. Then, Gamow predicted. By the way, also, besides of Gamow, Fermi wrote paper in 49, also about this hot universe. Not Gamow, but Fermi wrote, yeah? Not only Gamow wrote paper. But paper was using also some kind of secret cross-section for the deuterium, and therefore I think paper was not even published. So, uh, but finally, when the data were released, this 400 dropped to three. And you know, by the way, by at the beginning they were getting 400, they were really were getting 400. Because when photon is propagating to us, primordial photon, even without scattering, there is a bending of light by the nearby galaxies, you see, which deforms the picture. And it's called microlensing. And precisely give you 400. After you remove this effect, you are left with nothing, you see. So, what are the perspective of measuring FNL? Not so great perspective because it's already on the border what is called cosmic variance. For that you have to have much, much larger sample or you have to get uh, with CMB we are getting two and quarter dimensional picture of the universe because it's sky. But of course, we are getting the photons which were last scattered during 90,000 years. So it's 300,000 years. The picture was produced, but was produced by the photons, okay, uh, which were scattering, scattered within the layer 90,000 years. Therefore, we see not precisely three dimensional picture of the universe, but we see two and something dimension. Of course, you could get much better statistic if you would be able to measure bigger sample with much more statistic, okay? And some people were suggesting that, oh, maybe we could use 21 centimeter to measure this primordial non-Gaussianities, okay? But to get in 21 centimeter, accuracy, you have to build all these radio detectors on the moon, like Joe Silk is suggesting. I'm sure that, okay, American and Russian would prefer to build military bases there instead of radio telescope, as you know. By the way, actually, it's a good thing that, for instance, South Pole, not North Pole, I'm not going to say anything politically incorrect, yeah? But they invited me once even to give colloquium there, you know, because they have bases there, and they do not know how to use them, okay? They build the, uh, this ice cube or something like this one, but you have to justify all the existence of these bases. And in particular, all these first experiment, balloon experiment, were done in the South Pole, you see? Now people are building antennas in Greenland, where I discovered very cold, although I didn't go there when I heard how much. What is degrees? I said, no way, yeah? Forget about this. So, therefore, perspective for the measurement of FNL with bigger accuracy is impossible because people say, but today we have Euclid. But you should understand that after this so-called recombination, there was no linear evolution of perturbations. They had amplitude like 10 minus 4, 10 minus 5, at the moment when light decoupled. But after that, they were growing, growing, and growing. Finally, they formed galaxies, planets, stars, etc. And of course, as a result of this nonlinear growing, this FNL has grown to factor 10.5. Now, how can you imagine that you can subtract from one factor 10,5, the other factor 10,5, with accuracy to get three? Impossible, just impossible, especially 
taking into account the quality of all these observations which Euclid is doing, you see, all this galaxy clustering, etc. Now, question, multiverse or one universe? I think it's a lovely question on which I will finish, don't worry. <laughs> Okay, and I will leave more meaty things for tomorrow. Right? Well, I will show a lot of formulas just to make impressionistic style. Yeah, it's like in gallery. Yeah, yeah. But I will discuss more observational stuff and all these heroic experiments because before 1990, before the, the beginning of this precision cosmology, it also it was amazing thing. Also, people started to build telescopes in 19, huge number, yeah, so Hawaii, Chile, Atacama, etc. Yeah, so, um, multiverse of one universe. Of course, people were discussing this thing. New York Times was writing about it. People were writing a lot of papers, trying to introduce good measures. There was even some nice measures that we are living in the center of the universe and the homogeneity grow by factor 10 minus 5 towards to the horizon of the universe. I tell guy, look, but why our place is better than Andromeda, yeah? But of course, for instance, when you introduce the measures, in the bad post problem, it's not very easy thing. Imagine that you have infinite number of oranges and infinite number of apples. How you compare them? And one monkey. You give monkey the order. Take one orange, take one apple. Then you come to the conclusion that the number of oranges and apples are the same. But you give monkey order, take three apples and one orange. Then you will conclude that there are three times more apples than oranges. And when the things are infinite, then as you understand, okay, all these things becomes very uncertain. But first statement which I want to make that from the point of view of physics, both statements are equally correct or wrong. Doesn't matter, you can use correct or wrong because they are not falsifiable. You see, now, what about initial condition for perturbations? Because Eric, in the evening, perhaps, why he is sick? Because he asked me wrong question. He told me, started to tell me that initial conditions are very special, not generic. Of course, initial conditions for perturbations are very, very generic. For universe as a whole, I will discuss a little bit later, yeah. No problem with initial condition for perturbations because you can hear from many specialists in inflation that you have to postulate Bunch-Davis vacuum. What this statement means, it means that these specialists just have no idea what is Bunch-Davis vacuum. Because Bunch-Davis vacuum is the only invariant, the sitter invariant state for perfect the sitter for the massive scalar field. Okay, it has nothing to do with red tilted spectra because, okay, if he is amplitude, for instance, here is the scale which corresponds to the universe, then prediction of inflation that the spectra is ultra infrared divergent. Bunch Davis vacuum always goes down and it's infrared convergent, has finite. Renormalized energy momentum tensor, which is proportional to the curvature square. The, or, you don't need to postulate anything. You can even, don't need to postulate quantum fluctuations here. You can take any homogeneities here within the scale of the horizon. The only condition, you can begin with arbitrary homogeneities provided that they do not destroy right away the stage of the domination of dark energy. If they didn't destroy it right away, then after that, accelerated expansion 
will take care to throw away this garbage in the regions where we will never observe it. As I told it, it's universal vacuum cleaner, inflation. Because after it throws away all this garbage, you have normal Minkowski space within curvature scale for the desitter. And these are quantum fluctuations, you see, which after that is amplified. Of course, the picture. When people use this picture, they use the picture like you have stolen fluctuation from here and brought in the galactic scale. But then it was replaced by some fluctuation which came from subplankian scales. The same problem as with Hawking radiation, the same. It's just technicalities of the description. You see, there is no superplankian problem. It's again invention of the people who pay attention more to technicalities than to physics. Here, within this scale, you have Minkowski space. If you have stolen by expansion fluctuation from here, who will take care about replacing this stolen fluctuation? Mr. Heisenberg, it actually comes and will replace it immediately, especially taking into account that quantum fluctuation doesn't need to be replaced, doesn't need any energy. Therefore, all the talks about swamp plants, I even don't know what they are discussing right now, which are based with this kind of artificial superplanking problem, which doesn't exist, have no relevance. You could describe Minkowski space also in expanding coordinates. And again, you would say, oh, you are dealing with superplanking scales. No way, yeah, so just effect of coordinate system. It's coordinate system which allows you smoothly to go from here where you could introduce normal, perfect Minkowski coordinate system, okay, it's local, free falling Einstein elevator, you can smoothly relate it with the scale larger than the horizon, where there exists no static coordinate system, you see? Therefore, it's all... Forget about it. As a result, as I wrote, all garbage will be thrown away from the observable horizon and remaining quantum fluctuations will be amplified and produce the galaxies compared to alternatives. And as I told you, no dubbed quantum fluctuation. People just dubbed mechanism of amplification of these quantum fluctuations. Inflation is garbage cleaner. All other theory are garbage collectors. Okay? You can use it in your papers when you write about it. <laughs> because I have friend in both sides. I don't want to upset. Who creates the garbage? You don't care because you don't see this garbage. You can start with perfect state, which is vacuum, you see, then you don't care about garbage. You can start with garbage, but please do not stop right away the stage of accelerated expression. There will be no garbage. Of course, the ideal situation is there is no garbage, but it's irrelevant. This is insensitivity of the prediction to the initial conditions, as I said. You see, now, how generic are initial conditions for the universe in e and there are any problems with them in inflationary cosmology? This is the other interesting question. First paper, how to produce universe, causal universe, was written perhaps using this stage of accelerated expansion, was written by Braut, Englert, and Gunzik. In, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, I think, 77 or maybe 78. I forgot already. But you understand, already in this paper, when they realized, but they called it, I think, this stage not inflation, Francois tell me that called firewall. Yeah, so this was the reason why people didn't pay attention. I can tell you why people didn't pay attention. Because out of 30 pages of this paper, 
28 pages are completely irrelevant because they are trying to justify the appearance of the equation of state P is equal minus epsilon using particle production. If they would just postulate it, then okay, the other 28 pages of the paper you could forget, you see? This is, I told you, this is the, but okay, already when they realize that there is no problem to produce universe out of nothing, and the first guy who noticed that to produce universe is much more easy if you use dark energy, your question, why do we need dark energy to produce universe out of nothing? You see, you start with quantum fluctuations with the internal mass 10 minus 5 gram, yeah? And then you postulate that here in this drop you have dark energy. Then you have the stage of accelerated expansion and gravity acts like anti-gravity. And within 70 fold, you increase this mass from 10 minus 5 gram to 10 80 gram. No problem. And the side grows from 10 minus 33 centimeter to 10 minus 3 centimeter. This is the initial condition for the universe, you see. But you know that they wrote interesting sentence, this guy. We must not make too many universes. You see, I normally, when I want to make joke to, about Francois, I tell him, come on, guy, two is enough for you or too many? Or maybe you want not more than three? The problem here is not how many universes. The problem here, you can produce even infinite number of the universes. But if all of them will have the same statistical properties, you do not care because you can study physics. There could be one of the billion of universes where you put your water to boil on fire and as a result of statistical fluctuation, you will get ice. But you have never seen it in your life, right? Statistical fluctuation could give you reincarnation also, whatsoever. Where well, right now people draw conformal diagrams for so-called eternal black holes, I tell, guys, from where did you take them? Just ridiculous. This thing cannot exist because it consists of two white holes plus two black holes. How you can manage to match them? Also, by the way, the horizon of white hole is not stable. And singularity in past. Oh, there is some probability. I told, okay, there is also probability for the closed system for reincarnation. Correct? Because there is Poincaré cycle. So good philosophical question. And then some guy who invited this other guy told me, but I think probabilities are a little bit different. I told him, okay, come on, probabilities are not a little bit different. They are hugely different because for reincarnation, probability is much, much larger than for building this eternal black hole which you can find everywhere in the literature. For instance, okay, take the papers by Toft, which he's writing, I already stopped to discuss it with him, when he tells me that when I will get on the black hole, I will not go inside, I will reappear as Fourier transform in the other asymptotically free state. What can I say? Okay, nothing. At the beginning, I was asking him when I go to inside black hole, what will happen with me? The only answer which Gerard could find, he told me, I don't care about you. I told him, let's, trip, let's make trip together, yeah? Because when you are crossing horizon of large black hole, you don't feel it even. Besides that, you can try to communicate with your friends outside, but they do not hear you, but you can hear them. Now, Self-reproduction, this point of fluctuations brought something what actually led finally to the universe, which became, okay, completely inhomogeneous on large scales, 
But all on small, small scales, it's well approximated by Friedman's solution. You see? So Friedman's solution is not the whole universe, is the intermediate asymptotics anyway, okay? In the most probable picture when universe on large scales is inhomogeneous. But on the other hand, okay, how can we verify it? No way. Because we cannot see beyond horizon. Now, question is everything what could happen is happening when you believe in this self-reproduction. Not very good attitude, okay, because some people try to use it to explain why cosmological constant is small, yeah. You know, all possibilities were realized. I told guy, look, it's like, it was landscape called, it's like sleeping pill for you. You can now say that you solved all the problem, but everything what could be realized was realized, and you can go and sleep well. Then the reply of the guy was, but okay, I perhaps will never invent anything better in my life. Hey, but leave chance to the young people, okay? But the reaction of one American was very interesting. He said, oh, guy, you should be very good in stock market. Come on, I just lost money there. I was ready to kill him. <laughs> Not to give chance to young people, yeah. But now, uh, after Planck and WMAP, people found that effective potential should flatten, okay? And there should be difference in the energy densities. So energy density on this flattened potential during the stage when the galaxies are produced is 12 orders of magnitude less than the Planck and value. Therefore, it was called fine tuning again, okay? Because if before people were getting numbers 10 like minus, no, 10, minus 10 in power 30, they started to get the numbers 10 in power minus 10 in power uh, 9. But 10 in power minus 10 in power 9 is also not very good. And you can easily find Steinhardt road paper. After Planck, inflation is in trouble. Because you need fine tuning. You see, I think it's ridiculous. Also, my, some of my friends were calculating the number of universes, and they got number like 10 in power 10, in power 10, in power 10, in power 10, 87. I ask why not 88, yeah. <laughs> you know what is the number of atoms in the universe? 10, 10 to 80. Yes, 10 to 80. So you see, not in all physics auditorium, by the way, people know the answer to this question. <laughs> okay, good. So, of course, it's flat potential, but the most natural thing would be to begin inflation when you have Planckian density, but in this case, you are getting self-reproduction. Self-reproduction is that when you started inflation, you cannot shut it up. And if you cannot shut it up, you have infinite decitter space. If you believe in the temperature, there is wrong interpretation of the temperature of the decitter also, by the way, because if it would be real temperature, it would be decreasing because the sitter is expanding. So this temperature is nothing more than like unru temperature because of accelerated observer, you see? And if you want to get the Boltzmann brain because of thermal fluctuation, you have to put the, the brains of the guy who suggests this idea to be heated a little bit. So now, the question which appeared, can we simultaneously Avoid self-reproduction and unpredictable multi-mess and plus fine-tuning because people call the amplitude is fine-tuning. And you know that, okay, I was sitting, thinking, and then I invented again potential which solves everything. Namely, it allowed me to start inflation at the Planckian scale 
And then goes smoothly to this flat potential. Moreover, it gave me advantage. I could explain the number 10, 5, because this thing actually should happen when this potential is changing when n is 10, 5. So I am deriving a fundamental level also the amplitude of perturbation. Of course, in this particular model, which looks like, okay, it's like equivalent to the A squared gravity or Higgs inflation, but if I divide it by these two things, of course, I can say blah, blah, blah about two interacting brains. Then the whole thing can be avoided. Moreover, even recently we wrote the other paper where we used mimetic matter to avoid this self-reproduction. Therefore, it's only theoretical games. You know what is mimetic matter? Heard about it or not? Everybody believes that there are particles which explain dark matter. But okay, we invented some model where we added to Einstein equation the term like this one minus one, and then we got dark matter as an extra solution of Einstein equation without any particles. Therefore, if people will not find particles, they should not be upset. Then after that, of course, we found fundamental justification for cosmological constant for dark matter, starting from topology and using you know, commutative geometries. I told this story that Templeton Foundation gave to some Polish priest some price because he solved the problem of singularities using the concept of God plus non-commutative geometries of Alan Kohn. You see, so we wrote paper with Alan Kohn and Ali Shamsidin where we started with topologies and beginning from topologies okay, managed to justify the existence of cosmological constant as a constant of integration as a result of quantization of geometry and also we managed to justify requiring quantization of special volume, the appearance of dark matter without dark matter. Of course, you can say me start from topology and get these two things. You have to go to psychiatrist perhaps, might be, but I worry that if I go in front of me, there will be a long line of physicists who should check before. Okay, very good. And I think for today, I am in time. Conclusions CMB measurement have robustly proved quantum origin of the universe structure, irrespective of any alternative to inflation and further experiments on gravitational waves. So this is the lesson which you have to take with you. As Ginsburg was normally saying on his seminar, he was very tough, okay, to the speaker. He was telling, now formulate what I have to tell to my wife, what was today on seminar. <laughs> so here you can tell to your wife that we learned that we were all originated from the substance which was not smelling. Because quantum fluctuations do not smell, they have no energy to smell. It's the minimal state, you see. Okay, very good, and I think it's for today everything. Okay, thanks a lot, Professor Mukhanov. We, we have time uh, for questions. So if anybody has a question. <clears throat> we, have, we have one. Thank you very much for such uh, robust uh, uh, view and view, the theory of, of uh, cosmol cosmic inflation, which is uh, very important and is, uh, is robust and is defined. But you began yesterday with a picture showing the electron, remember, and the galaxy or yes. the scale, yeah. And you say that it's a similarity. Because behind of both Heisenberg and certain relation. Yes, but you are still uh, using this uh, concept in your uh, theory. Of course. And, uh, yes, but can this uh, point, uh, this argument, can be taken as a uh, 
an uh, additional argument for uh, fractality of the universe. What do you mean fractality? I don't that know. The universe is a fractal. On the each no, is why it's fractal. It's of course has complicated logical structure, but you know what does it mean fractality in this sense? There are clusters of galaxies, as you know. There are filaments because okay, there are walls and there are voids. I do not know what does mean fractality because no. I am the, starting with a random Gaussian process, and after that I use gravitational instability to get fractality, what you call, if you call it fractality of the universe. I mean, in different scales, I have different substructures. Yeah, but they possess the same similarity. Yes, absolutely. And that is a definition of fractal. Yeah, it's then, OK, easy. of course, you can take this kind of random Gaussian field when the universe was young, 300,000 years old, and then follow gravitational instability, okay? Normally people do it on computer. And then you are getting this perfect web-like structure, fractality, self-similarity, by the way, which is, you are right in this sense, because it's again uh, so-called intermediate asymptotics, because if we will wait for some time, then you will get larger clusters, then also the other filaments, the other walls, and then actually there will be even bigger voids. Why this thing actually is happening? Imagine that we have one less extra dimension. Then imagine landscape in mountains. Then the peak of the mountains correspond to the places where your clusters of galaxies will form. Then normally the peaks of the Mountains are connected, I do not know how they are called, okay, when you go from one mountain to the other. Saddle point, saddle point, yeah, like saddle thing. Here you form filaments where the density is less than in the clusters, but nevertheless it's larger then density, normal density. Then if you would add more, one more dimension, if you would think in four dimensions, then you reduce one thing more, then you will get walls. And between walls, you have big, empty uh, spaces. Then if you will wait, then this structure will evolve in self-similar way, just all scales will be growing. In this sense, you are right, there is fractality, and by the way, it follows from what people call the Dovich approximation, because people were thinking about spherical asymmetrical gravitational collapse, but the most generic is asymmetrical, you see. And of course, for this kind of spectrum which we are getting, in spite of the fact that original motivation for Zeldovich was sharp end of the spectrum, but for the flat spectrum, which we have, okay, you can use precisely this picture, where you could use what people call the Zeldovich approximation. Because I re recall one of the conferences where some guy who is doing numerical simulation was telling, why do we need all these approximations, okay, if we have exact theory, which is Newtonian theory, which describes and particles. I told him, come on, guy, go to restaurant, and what would you say if the waiter, instead of bringing you normal menu, will bring you hundreds of volumes with microscopical description of molecular content of your dishes? You see, approximation, we need to reduce, okay, this huge description to normal menu, you see? Very good point. May I have one more question? I have one more sure, question. sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, it's not me who you, decides, yeah. but okay. <laughs> you, you began uh, today and yesterday also the same that uh, black energy is useless now. Today so, it's useless. Yes. But just imagine that you, what will make you to change your opinion, your view, to, to be it, uh, use, useful? Can, let's say, from modern, uh, not modern, but a new point of view, like uh, emergent uh, gravity, um, emergent space-time, can be 
black energy linked somehow with the immersion space time? At the moment, no way, because you know that in Planck units, uh, Planck energy density is 1094 gram over centimeter cube. Okay, the average energy density of this dark energy today is 10 minus 29. So it's mismatched 10 and power minus 120. And this is really the number which is very difficult to explain. We wrote some paper, and why it should dominate precisely today, because if it dominates today, in past you can forget about it, soon in future you will see nothing besides of this component, as you know very well. But we wrote some paper about so-called K essence, where we made some model which was rather ugly, but it has very simple idea, in a sense that when gravity was dominated by radiation, it was strong enough because I told you that radiation also contributes to the gravity. And we invented some kind of component when gravity is strong enough, it tells this component, follow me. Go along my equation of state, you see? Just wait, wait one minute, I will shut up telephone. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, uh, then when it comes, does dominated stage, yeah? Energy density of radiation doesn't contribute anymore, and this guy tells, Come on, I don't want to follow you anymore. I will go to my own attractor, and then it goes. It has an attractor which precisely corresponds to this dark energy. It's the only some kind of explanation of the cosmic coincidence, as you understand, because all others introduce this parameter 10 minus 120 in one or the other way. And okay, this paper of K essence, we relate this stage of domination of dark energy with the moment which is not far away from us, namely the moment when energy density of radiation was equal to the energy density of cold matter, you see? So at least you relate to things. Otherwise, it's just always postulated. You can build this number like exponent, minus exponent, minus exponent, and et cetera. All this emerging space has nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing to do. And at the moment also it's nothing more than just blah, blah, blah. And as you know, if you would learn Marxism-Leninism, you would know that according to Hegel, yeah, by the way, not to Stalin or Lenin, that everything is developing on spiral, yeah? But you come to the next level. When people start to speak right now about emergent space-time, etc., etc., all these kind of talks were so popular 50 years ago, you cannot even imagine, but then you were all forgotten. Or better to say, people do not want to read this literature which was 50 years ago. You see, because at the end of 60s, this I know from the other guy, who is by the way quite important, therefore I will not name him. He told me, look, actually at the end of 60s, when we were student, we were told that we should not waste our time to study general relativity and statistical physics because it's two sciences which are finished. Then, look, when people started to study entangled states five years ago, ten years ago, with, in relation with useless quantum computers, anyway, yeah? But, nevertheless, okay, the whole thing was known already after creation of quantum mechanics. And Schrodinger was writing 50 pages paper where he tried to realize this thing. Finally, he gave up and he said somewhere in the interview, if I would know what kind of philosophical disaster consequences would have this equation, I would never write it. You see? And in your theory, uh, amount of dark energy, it is equal from the beginning of the universe or is it increasing by time? No, 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 no. My dark energy has nothing to do with current dark energy. My dark energy is useful dark energy. 
which after that can decay, they can remain a little bit, whatever you want, but okay. You can build model where it will be the remnant of this thing, but I don't have any good model for that, you see? Uh -huh. Okay, so, yes. Oh, we have another question. Yes. It, it, it's just a clarificatory question. Could you go back to the slide with the smoking guns that you had? Yes. Here. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about the adiabatic thing. So like in the sense that if that part was not true, what kind of effect on the CMB would uh, it have? Like what should I expect no, to I see? No, I tell you. Adiabatic, of course, always you get when you start with one component which is responsible for everything. I can easily generate, for instance, entropy perturbation whatsoever, but uh, for that I need at least two components. One component is responsible for one thing, the other component is responsible for the other thing. But in this case, I can do practically everything. Second thing, okay, when cosmological constant or dark energy was discovered, then you know, Scientific Americans appears with very funny title page. Inflation is in trouble because it didn't predict cosmological constant. Come on, okay? It means that the guys who were given interview have no slightest idea because inflation was not supposed to predict the whole thing, yeah? Inflation was just predicting the geometry of the universe, so sum of all of the component of the matter, because inflation adjusts the rate of the expansion to this kind of six. And then, okay, how component appears there, it's already particle physics. You could refer to particle physics, but not to the present, but to the past, because we do not know. We have no idea what is as energy is more than 14 TV. Therefore, all this kind of speculation, fine-tuning, need for supersymmetry, etc., etc., et or extra dimensions. It's nothing more than just fantasy of some people. You see, the fact that Higgs mass is divergent like k squared doesn't give you the right to approximate this kind of behavior up to the energies, 12 orders of magnitude above, because you have no idea what is above. It's not more than your fantasy, as you understand. Okay. There is no any indication that cosmology is so rough theory that, okay, when you hope to extract for particle physics something useful, you can forget about it. Uh, I have a, a curiosity. Because uh, we talked about uh, um, inflation, uh, quantum fluctua fluctuations uh, generating the structure of the universe and uh, the multiverse. So my, my question is, uh, is about something that I read one, two years ago in a book by Gerard Saskai, and the book is uh, The Cosmic Landscape. I know. Yeah. Book. And uh, Saskai wrote that uh, many physicists are convinced that uh, inflation uh, uh, implies uh, eternal inflation. And I, I just want to, to ask you why many people uh, think that. Okay, you, know. you understand that a lot of people are voting sometimes for some president who are, I am sorry, disaster president. Therefore, many physicists also can be convinced in some kind of rubbish things but you understand that, of course, this conviction was very, very widespread in spite of the fact that, you know, that it was never really proven fact because you were taking the knowledge which exists and then approximating it beyond the limits. And I showed how to change it, okay? For instance, all this kind of self-reproductions multi-land, or how it's called, uh, scape land, etc., 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 is nothing more than just unjustified speculation behind of which 
There is no even literal experimental evidence. No even, okay, 10 minus 100 degree of experimental evidence. It's mostly fantasy. Or how we called it today, Vera. Oh, Veronica, yeah. So, fantasy, fantasy, fantasy. It's all fantasy of some people. Of course, you can have fantasy, but you are, should not forget that physics is about nature. You see, when I try to explain it to physicists, they tell me, experimental physics, why you tell us so trivial thing which we all know? But then you go to the other conference, you tell the same thing, they start to argue with you, telling, no, there are some theories which are unavoidable logical consequences of something. There are no such theories. You see, all theorems in physics were happen to be wrong. For instance, take this Penrose theorems about singularities. All of them happen to be not working. Why? Because they are proven under certain conditions. Positive energy, epsilon plus 3p larger than zero, epsilon plus p larger than zero. And all of these conditions are violated. For instance, strong energy dominance condition is violated experimentally already by the discovery of dark energy today. You see, then I can write theory very easily where I can violate epsilon plus p. I can avoid singularity today like this one. If I would be able to do when I was a student, I would be happy, but today I'm not even happy with it. You see, I'm supposed to give talk in three days about resolving singularities. It happened, okay, as a result of very hard work, we managed to resolve singularity even inside black hole, which is quite non-trivial stuff. It's like an isotropic universe. You see, what happens is that, okay, it's not a big deal. But the main thing about it is that it's unfortunately not verifiable. And this thing, Wheeler was calling that this is so-called catastrophe or collapse of modern physics, the existence of these singularities. Penrose, by the way, never have proven the existence of black hole, as you know. Penrose was assuming that there are black holes, there is actually this horizon. And after that, he was proving the existence of not even existence of singularity, geodesic incompleteness of the manifold. You see? 